namesake Luke. And it's Acts chapter 6. The last time I heard this passage read was at the King Roy Church of Christ several months ago on the eve of their general meeting. And uh, I think it's rather pertinent, Luke. I think you're in on a thing or two when uh, you chose this because it's very pertinent to uh, where we're at as a church and some of the things that we need to take on board. So Acts chapter 6, 1 to 6. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, uh, choose seven men from among you who are full of, known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn their, this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenos, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Amen. Thank you, Luke. Church, it's uh, great to be with you today. Um, in what will probably be my second last time with you for, um, well, probably for quite a while, unless we post back here. We've got news now that, uh, or confirmation that we are off to Wodonga in the new year. Uh, well, I'll take my initial posting as an Army chaplain with uh, the Army School of Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Although, um, certainly said to. Um, to leave Brisbane and to leave uh, folks like yourself. It's now, it comes to my attention that it's about, uh, it's about seven years since uh, I've been sharing with you here now on a regular basis. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's a sad time to leave, but uh, an exciting opportunity that God's opened up for us. And uh, so we look forward to, to taking the next, the next journey in, um, in our, our ministry with God. So, yeah, thank you very much for that, and I look forward to coming again on the 18th to share with you for the final time. As John just read uh, from the book of Acts, today I want to talk about something that might sound like a little bit of an odd title. Uh, I'm calling it the most overlooked key to church growth. And as I thought through it a little bit, I thought maybe a better title for it would be the best way to communicate Christianity with credibility. Well, let me, before I get into that this morning, I want to share with you uh, another story. And it's from the 17th century. Has anybody heard of a German preacher by the name of August Frank? Anyone? Well, see, he was a Lutheran minister, and he had seen the homeless children in his city. And he was so moved by their living conditions that he decided to found an orphanage for them. But as often the case with such ministries, Money was always tight and he hardly had enough funds to feed the children. One day a widow came to his door begging for just a single gold coin, known as a ducat. And he, he sadly explained to her that he hadn't the money and had no way to help her. To his shock, she collapsed on the step and began to weep. Moved by her tears, Frank asked her to wait while he went to his room and prayed. The more he prayed, the more compelled he felt that God was prompting him to give the widow the money. And so he did. Two days later, he received a warm letter of thanks from the widow saying, because of his generosity, she had asked the Lord to share the orphanage with gifts. He was touched by the letter, but was soon surprised later that day when a rich woman of the city came to his door and gave him 12 ducats. 
Not long after that, a friend from Sweden gave him two more. He was humbled to think that God had so amply rewarded him for his mega gift to the widow. But God wasn't done yet. It seems a German prince had died not long before this, and in his will, he left 500 gold pieces as a bequest to the orphanage. See, a preacher met the needs of a destitute widow, and God rewarded him. And in this text that we heard this morning, we read a similar story. By the time we get to Acts 6, what we need to understand is that the early church had experienced heady times. At Pentecost, 3,000 Jews repented of their sins and were baptised into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And over the next few days, the church grew to 5,000 and then more. But then they hit a minor snag. As you may recall from what John just read and or from previous chapters before that, there were a number of people in this fledgling church that were needy. And they'd come from a great distance when they were converted to Jesus. And they decided to stay right there in Jerusalem with all the other believers. So folks like Barnabas went and sold some of his property and gave the proceeds to the apostles to distribute to the poor. But there was a problem. And the problem was that the church of that day suffered from the same kind of problems that modern congregations have. Have you ever noticed in some churches that people tend to hang around with folks that they have common interests with? These groupings are often called cliques. And while cliques sometimes have a bad reputation, they're not necessarily all that bad in and of themselves in that everyone in the clique are people that they're comfortable with. It's one of those things where they sort of say, oh, well, they circle the wagons. It becomes a bit of a closed circle. And these people only hang out with their kind of people. People in such cliques often end up spending time with and thinking about only those in their close circle of friends. And that's kind of what happened here at Jerusalem. There were the local Christians, Jewish believers that had been born and raised around Jerusalem. Then there were the outsiders, the Hellenists or Gretchens. And they were Jewish believers too, but their accent was different. And because they'd been born and raised in other countries, they didn't quite fit in. And well, it seems the local boys who were responsible for taking care of the widows were overlooking the widows from out of town. They may not have meant to slight these ladies. They may simply have been an oversight. But frankly, the Hellenists didn't run in their circle. It was kind of an out of sight, out of mind type of thing. Whatever the reason, these widows were being ignored in their daily distribution of assistance. And some of them were getting upset. And the KGV says there was some murmuring going on. If you like complaining. We all know that murmuring is not a good thing at church, don't we? And this comes to the attention of the apostles and they say it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word in Acts 6 verses 2 to 4. In one of the commentaries, it notes that the names of the seven men were all Greek. It's likely they were all of the Gretchen class, which would have effectively restored some mutual confidence. Now, what's interesting is that after these seven men were selected, and after the needs of the widows were met, so the word of God spread. Numbers of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith, says in Acts 6 verse 7. Do you know what that means? It means when the church took care of the widows, the church grew. Now I'm convinced that if you would go to just about any church growth seminar, you would never, or at least very unlikely, hear that a great way for the church to experience dynamic growth 
would be for them to take care of widows and orphans and the needy. It wouldn't be cutting edge type of teaching. And I'd be willing to bet that you'd never hear this proposed. Yet that's precisely what we read here in Acts 6. When they met the needs of the widows, the disciples multiplied greatly. Now when you hear many experts on church growth, they'll tell you that the church needs to know who they're going after. A successful church, we might be told, needs to have a target audience. They might say a church needs to decide who they're going after, they're going to target, so they can focus all of their advertising, all their methods, and all their activities on that target group. They might say they're going after millennials, or young families, or upwardly mobile business folk. Once they know who to target, they know how to market themselves for that specific group. Now I have to admit that that method probably has some merit and probably works in some respects. And it could yield a prominent, powerful and dynamic congregation. But the kind of thinking always has annoyed me to a sense. You know why it annoys me? Because Jesus only had one group of people that he went after. He only had one part of the audience that he focused on. Do you know what that target audience was? Sinners, which essentially is everyone. Sinners. Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. In Luke 19, verse 10. And again, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Luke 5, 32. See, Jesus never went after the rich and the powerful. He didn't tailor his ministry to young married couples. He didn't fashion his message for millennials of his age. Do you know what Jesus did do? He spent his time with the common folks. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, he raised the widow's son from the dead. He said to his audience, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. He spent his time with the rejects the sinners, the tax collectors, the losers. Jesus built his church on the outcasts of society. Even his 12 disciples weren't all that impressive, ordinary men that he told to himself. And now we see in Acts 6, God driving that truth home again to us. The only way to build the kind of church that Jesus wants to build is to reach out to the poor, the needy and the rejected of society. That's the way to build Christ's church. But while we're helping the widows and the orphans and the needy cause a church to grow, the way that Jesus wants it to grow. Well, I can think of two reasons that I'll refer to shortly, but also understand that it's by these sort of actions that we grow ourselves as disciples. The other reasons are, is if we do this, help the poor and the widow and the orphan, God will build the church. It's a supernatural thing because we serve a supernatural God. And our God makes these kinds of people a priority. Psalm 68 verse 5 tells us, A father to the fatherless, a defender of the widows, is God in his holy dwelling. In Isaiah 1 verse 17, God tells his people to learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, Plead the case of the widow. In the New Testament, God repeats that for us. Religion that, our, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In James 1 verse 27. So it's a drumbeat across the scriptures. God loves it when his people help the poor and the afflicted, especially when it comes to those who struggle in the church. That's what Galatians 6 verse 9 to 10 tells us. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap the harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See, this is a truth that at Rivers we've started to invest in. 
certainly in the last two and a half years that I've been in there, we're starting to understand that as we invest more in our food bank, in our special needs ministry and in our Christian crisis caravan, the results have been that people who wouldn't normally come anywhere near the church, we now have an opportunity to engage with. Also read recently about one church whose preacher recalled, years before we built this new sanctuary area, we had the money we needed to start building. But just about the time we got ready to make that decision, the recession hit. Several people in the congregation were struggling financially and the leadership decided it would not be appropriate to build when so many were hurting. They made the decision to take the money that had been set aside for the building and use that as a kind of slush fund to assist those in need. Of course, this was the kind of thing that needed to be run by the congregation. And it just so happened that when the annual congregation meeting was just a couple of weeks away, when Larry, one of our deacons in charge of the building fund, stood up at the congregation meeting, at the congregation meeting and explained what the leadership had in mind and the entire group broke out in applause. I thought I'd died, died and gone to heaven. I was so proud of the church at that point I could burst out in song and God has blessed us ever since. See, God is especially appreciative when we do what we do sacrificially. In Mark 12 we're told about the time Jesus was at the temple and watched as people put their money in the offering box. Some scholars believe that the offering box was where people placed money to help the poor and that this box had a metal horn or a trumpet that allowed the coins to make noise as the coins banged their way down into the box. And Jesus watched as the rich put large sums of money into that box. Lots of coins, lots of noise. But then along came a poor widow and do you know what she put in that box? Two small coins, a widow's mite. It was all she had. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Mark 12, verses 43 to 44. So did you catch that? Jesus paid attention to her gift. Jesus was impressed by her gift. She gave sacrificially to help the poor. In Acts 6, God is telling us that. He paid attention to the church who took care of its widows. When they did that, God made the church grow. Now, of course, that would be enough for God to make the church grow. But there's a second reason that the church grew at this point. See, folks around the church began to pay attention. That's what Jesus said would happen in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See, bear in mind the early church wasn't helping the widows so that they could be praised. They didn't advertise on the marquee how much they'd given to the widows that week. All put out a circular brag about their ministry. What they did, they did for Jesus. They were doing what they were doing because that's what Christians were supposed to do and people outside the church paid attention. When we act with credibility, people start to pay attention and our words have power. So I recently read a book I heard about a book by, the, by a historian by the name of Rodney Stark. Anyone heard of Rodney Stark? He wrote a book called The Triumph of Christianity, How the Jesus Movement Became the World's Largest Religion. As you might imagine, he was describing what led to the phenomenal growth of Christ Church in the first few centuries. So one of the things that Stark discussed was why the church grew so dramatically in the Roman world. And he explained in that in ancient Rome, the pagans had two philosophies that were diametrically different than Christianity. The first was that the Romans feared death. 
They believe the grave either led to non-existence or at best a drug existence in a shadowy underworld. So they literally ran from death and clung to life for all they were worth. And the second is that the Romans viewed mercy and pity as things to be scoffed at and ridiculed. The philosophers of the day taught that mercy was unreasonable and that the cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. And it seems in history that in AD 165 that a plague struck the Roman Empire that shook the world. The plague hit the, hit the city and many people, including the doctors, left town. One person of that day noted that the non-Christians deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends and they cast them out into the streets where they were half dead and left the dead like refuge unburied. But many of the Christians didn't do that. They stayed and took care of the sick and the dying. Now why on earth would they do that? Well, First, the Christians didn't fear death. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 17. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55. So Christians believe that if they died from disease, contracted while caring for the ill, the result for them would be glorious. And so they would be able to overcome their fears. And secondly, unlike the Romans, who felt that mercy was a character flaw, the Christians saw mercy was what Jesus had called them to do. And we need to remember that caring for the sick then was much different than it is now. Today, if you get sick, you can go to the hospital. And they'll treat you with antibiotics and other medicines. But they didn't have those back then. So if they didn't have the medicines, we have today help the Christians of that day care for the sick. Well, they gave the sick what they could. Food, water, and compassion. And many of those that they cared for survived. And their willingness to help people in the face of certain death influenced many Romans to turn to Christ. Let me close here. The point is this. The early church grew the way Jesus wanted them to grow because they had the same priorities as Jesus. When we have the same priorities as Jesus, that's what will happen. Churches that help the poor, the widows and the needies will grow. We're not talking about becoming a dynamic megachurch. That's not the goal anyway. The goal is to become the church that Jesus died to establish. When a church does that, they will grow for God and not for themselves. Christ's kind of church will grow because people love and serve widows and the needies and their hands will be the hands of servants. Let me finish with the story from the early 1500s. Two struggling artists shared a room. They formed a pact. One of them would work at manual labor to support them while the other worked at his art and began to develop the patrons. And then the other artists could focus on his artistic works. Albert Durer, has anyone heard of him? Was the first to focus on his art and his friend spent time earning whatever he could as a labourer. Dura eventually became recognised and began to sell some of his work. But by that time, his friend had used his hand so much in hard labour that they had become gnarled and stiff and Dura was heartbroken. Then one day as Dura was working on a painting, he heard mumbling in the next room. Thinking something might be wrong, he rose and walked to the door. There he saw his friend bowing over a meal, his hands folded in prayer. From that scene, Drew painted probably his most famous painting, certainly one of his most remembered. 
and gave a memorial to the faithfulness of his friend's hands. Now most of you probably don't know who Albert Durer was, but many of you would recognise the painting. Or you may not have known the artist, you knew the hands of the servant, and that's why that painting is so well known. It's the same with the world and the people of this world will be moved when we show them the hands and hearts of the servant. May God bless you as we take that into our own hearts this week to show the love of Christ to people in a